Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the How Did It Happen podcast. I'm so happy to have you here as I am with every episode. And today, I'm fulfilling my promise to you with another amazing success story. I've got Devin Harris on the show. Devin, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Mike, my man. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure. Yeah, this is going to be fun because um, yeah. you are going to kind of be blown away by Devin. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why that's going to be the case. And then we're going to fill in the blanks after we get started. Mm -hmm. Devin Harris was raised in the slums of Kingston, Jamaica, a place called in a place called Olympic Gardens that would turn out to be an ir ironic name. Um, yet he graduated from the prestigious Royal Military Academy Sandhurst in England and served as an officer in the Jamaica Defense Force. He started off as a barefoot boy trying to win a track race and became a member of his country's first Olympic bobsled team. Circumstances and others constantly told Devin Harris it was impossible, but at every step of the way, he kept on pushing and found a way to make it possible. Since his days on the bobsled slope uh, as a three-time Olympian, that's three times, Devin Harris has become a top corporate motivational keynote speaker and author, sharing his philosophy on keep on pushing, his philosophy of keep on pushing and never stop dreaming with Fortune 100 companies across many industries. Devin is also the founder and CEO of the Keep On Pushing Foundation, a New York-based 501c3 charity focused on helping children in disadvantaged communities receive a quality education. Devin's written three books, a children's book called Yes, I Can, a semi-autobiographical motivational book called Keep On Pushing, Hot Lessons from Cool, Running, from cool Runnings, and goals, how to set and achieve them. Finally, in 2018, Devin was inducted into the World Olympian Association as an Olympian for life. Devin's podcast is called Keep On Pushing. I was fortunate to be a guest on his show. It's a very cool show. You should check it out and follow it. And you can find out more about Devin at Devin Harris, D-E-V-O-N, Harris with two R's dot com. So Devin, let's get started with this. How did it happen for you? <laughs> That's a loaded question, man. Where do I start with that? Um, I'm going to go all the way back to my early years. You know, I spent those with my grandmother in rural Jamaica, a small, you know, rural little district on the south coast of Jamaica. And the thing I remember about my grandmother is that she was an amazing storyteller. And the stories I remember the most, Mike, are the ones, or I should I say, have the greatest impact on me were the ones she told me about soldiers and the amazing things they could do and not get hurt, you know? And it, it fired up my little five-year-old imagination. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if I could do that, but I'd like to try. And it kind of inspired me to want to be a soldier. More, more importantly, I think it's inspired me to want to do things, pursue results, go after goals that everybody else think is impossible or, you know, at best difficult. And mm -hmm. that's kind of where it started for me. I just... It stirred, that stirred something in me that got me to keep doing stuff that I'm not supposed to be doing, I suppose. Was there, was there a military um, sort of history in your family, Devin, that your, that your grandmother was talking about? Or was she just talking about soldiers in, in general? Or how was, how was it that she was so interested in telling you those stories? Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm, I think I'm the, first, I'm the first soldier in my family. Um, there's no military history, but we live in a country where soldiers are really respected, right? They're seen as tough and hardy and, and I guess, protective as well. Um, just something to look up to. So especially if you, you know, like my mother, grandmother's a country bumpkin, man. Right? You know, they live in the country. They are very impressionable people, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and so, but just generally, I think soldiers, we just grew up with a, a kind of a love and a respect for soldiers. And so she's, she's telling you these stories at five years old and you're getting all... Yeah, I get a little feedback there, right? Let's see what we got. All right. That's better? Yeah. Uh, I heard a little bit. Yeah, I'm still hearing it a little bit. Um, well, I wasn't even hearing you before, man. Oh. Uh, what's that? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, MacBook. 
speakers. Let me just, uh, my book, built in my, how is that? Uh, how is it for you? How's it for you? Uh, I'm hearing you good. I'm hearing you okay. Yeah, I hear myself though. I, I, mm. Let me. There's always something, right? Check, check, check. Uh, let's see. Now I'm not hearing myself. Okay, we can try it again. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I'll go from the point of my last question and just start it again and see what we do here. Okay, three, two, one. So your grandmother's telling you these stories as a five-year-old and, and, and you're getting all excited about the allure of being a soldier and, and what that might mean for you. But what do you do with that? I mean, as a five-year-old, besides it being like something you're imagining or something you're fixated on because of your grandmother, what are you actually doing in your life or can you even remember? Like, what do you, how did you make something out of what she was telling you? That's a, you know, I've never been asked that question before. Uh, so now you are forcing me to think, why? <laughs> um, actually, I don't know that I did anything different. I just kind of grew up and uh, it was always in the back of my head. So I fantasized about it. I, uh, you know, um, uh, I joined the, 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 the Boy Scouts. And it's back in the day when you had this, who remember those little I guess people our age will remember those little plastic toy soldiers. Oh. Um, and so you you play with them, right? Playing war games and that kind of stuff. And it does, so it, it stayed with me. And throughout my years, I've, I've wanted to be different things, you know, lawyer, doctor, that, you know, that kind of stuff. But I always come back to soldier. And that became the thing. And what was going on with the rest of your family while you were growing up? Tell me about your parents and your siblings and what, where were you, how differently were they thinking about things than, way you, than, than the way you were thinking about things? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, so I, as I said, I spent my early years with my grandmother. I think I moved back to Kingston to live with my dad when I was uh, five years old or thereabouts. Um, and so I grew up in, as you mentioned, Olympic Gardens, right? Sounds like a, uh, a suburb of Kingston, but it's actually one of the toughest ghettos in the world. Uh, it's really like rough. Those places you would um, have to apply to as a, like a prestigious Olympic pre-Olympic training school, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. But yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's it's, it's, uh, it's there's trickery in the name. <laughs> <laughs> As it were, you know, so we grew up really poor, impoverished, uh, violent kind of environment. Um, you know, my dad was a, a bus driver, worked for um, the national uh, bus company as a driver. My stepmom was actually employed for the entire time I was growing up, you know, so that didn't make life easy, you know, financially for us. Um, but, you know, I, I guess, you know, when you're in an environment like that and you you, you find a way to be happy and you find a way to live. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I discovered sports. I, um, you know, loved school, you know, played with my siblings. Uh, you know, so I grew up, and I'll, I'll tell you now, so I grew up with, let's say, two sets of siblings because my, my, my birth mother had, uh, you know, a bunch of kids as well. So, you know, I'm the first uh, of, hold your breath, 16 kids. So I grew up with about half of them <laughs> and the other half, you know, my mother's, which are my dad's kids and my mother's kids, you know, we just kind of meet up wherever in just a normal run of life. Um, but we have found a way, despite all of that, to be relatively close even today. Okay. And the grandmother you talked about, is that your mom's mom or your dad's mom? My dad's mom. Dad's mom is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 16. And you, <laughs> <laughs> and you, you got to go big. <laughs> you got to yeah, go big. Yeah. Right. Keep on pushing. Why not? <laughs> did, uh, did, were you ever attracted to the allure of the streets or being part of, you know, n not 
the direction you ended up on? Yeah, no, no, that's a really good question too. I, I guess the first thing is that my dad would probably kill me. That, that, that was not in the equation, man, hanging out, uh, no. Um, but then there was another part of me and, and I would see it, right? I would see this group of boys hanging out and somebody was always getting beaten up in that group. And I remember just looking at them and going, oh, I'm so glad my father don't allow me to hang out because that would not be me getting beaten up. You know, I'd be bursting, busting somebody's head and running home. Right. So that, that, that kind of lifestyle was never attractive to me at all. You know, because I, I didn't like the dynamics that I observed in the groups. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit... I was, I was about to say I'm a little bit of a loner. Yes, I guess I am. I, I am the dude who likes to uh, march to the beat of his own drums. And when you're in a group like that, um, it, it doesn't always work. Or it makes it difficult to, I, oh, no, I want to do this. If you guys want to join me, fine. But I'm not doing that kind of thing, you know? Okay. So you never really needed, a, you, you never needed the sort of peer approval that um, so many people end up needing. It's, that's that's correct yeah mm -hmm. yeah and it's good that you obviously you had your dad's support and and maybe the sort of uh, mm, support is like support is a kind <laughs> word i wouldn't right. quite describe it as support but okay fine support <laughs> how, how would you describe it this is 2022 uh, intimidation you use the correct word okay. there man intimidation yeah <laughs> this yeah. is 2022 <laughs> Uh, okay, the path toward to the uh, Royal Military Academy, which was which was not in Jamaica, right? That was in England. So how does how does what, what did you have to push to get that to? <sighs> Man, um, so you, you know, fortunately, I grew up in Jamaica, where we we uh, we're based on the British system, the educational system, the military, the public laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? We didn't have the little Boston Tea Party thing, so we're cool with England, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're still cool with them, and um, we um, so so you kind of have to go through school, you know, to go from. Um, elementary school to high school, you have to pass an exam. So it's a, dude, it's an entire process, right? So I eventually get to high school and we, again, based on the British system. So we, at the end of high school, they do these exams from the University of Cambridge or Oxford, all, le all levels. Um, and I ended up going back to school for two extra years to do A levels, advanced levels, which is kind of like pre-university stuff. Okay. On the strength of that, those passes, I'm able to now apply to the officer corps of the Jamaica Defense Force. That only gets you in the door. So I turned up, you know, all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed that morning, and there were 33 of us um, waiting to go do this rigorous three-day selection process. And before we got started, that 33 was down to nine. And then you heard through the grapevine, oh, they're looking for five people. I don't think that's that's true now that I know how the process works. And they were looking for five. And I'm like, okay, so then it means that four of us not, aren't making it, <laughs> you know? Um, anyway, we went through the process, uh, which was pretty rigorous. And in the end, I was the top pick of only three that made it. Only uh, 33. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, then I went through 18 weeks of the most miserable uh, uh, time in my life, you know, basic training uh, in Jamaica. And then they, they smiled on me and sent me to Sandhurst so I could train to become an officer. So it sounds like that's where the soldiers earn their respect <laughs> that your grandmother was talking about, right? If you, 33 out of 33, and I know everyone doesn't go through the same thing, but then... Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, there's a very there's a different um, process when you're an enlisted soldier when you just join as an enlisted man. But for as officers, you ha kind of have to go through this three day process. And I have, as an officer, have been one of the officers selecting other candidates. And I've had selection. I've been on selection boards. That's what we call them, where we didn't select anybody. We didn't think that they they were up to snuff. Oh, is that right? It, yeah, it's challenging. Yeah, we don't just, 
you know, they took me because of my smile, but we don't take everybody else because of their smile, you know what I mean? <laughs> Dude, I, 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 work, I work so hard during that three days, man. Like, I just like, you know, because they talk about where it began and it's like, wherever it is that it began for me, there's, I, I, like getting into the officer court was my shot to move forward. Failing would mean that I would go back to Olympic Gardens. That wasn't part of the plan. So I had to dig deep. Uh, okay. So if you failed, you didn't like drop down to enlisted status, in other words. You, no, no, you, you go home to go sit back in Olympic Gardens and, uh, you know, wonder if I should be hanging out with those guys over there, which was not part of the plan at all, no. Do you remember, Devin, was you're seeing these guys drop out. Was that giving you strength or was that, you know, challenging your mind? Yeah, well... Yeah, so you know, I remember. So once you got, you saw these guys being with the numbers being whittled down from thirty-three to nine. And I remember um, we're having this kind of discussion, and people are like, "Man, if I don't make it, I'm going to reapply in three months or six months or a year." And I remember blurting out, "I'm not coming back." And they all kind of looked at me. I was like, "Oh, this guy is serious." And I and I was actually thinking to myself, I just happened to blurt out aloud, and everybody heard. And I and then I so I responded after that. I said after that, I'm not coming back because I'm not going home. And so I got down to I got down to that nine who were going to do the actual selection process. And it's it's difficult to know how you're doing. I was kind of keeping tabs in my head, you know, assessing my performance and assessing the other guy's performance. And you know, I, I never put myself at one, but I was always in my head firmly in the top five because I'd heard that they were going to select five. I did the same thing with the boxer team trials. Um, but yeah, it turned out that I was a top pick. So, you know, things worked out for me. And do you, do you keep in touch with the, the other two who were in that sort of top three? Uh, uh, well, we served together. Um, we haven't been in touch. I've been out of the army now for 30 years, man. Jeez, getting up there. Um, so, so it's been a while since I've, uh, I've spoken to the other two okay. guys. I thought maybe there was sort of a real band of brotherhoods kind of thing. Like, when you go through something like that, that might yeah. Um, so what was your time like in the, in the, in the military, in the defense force? Uh, dude, I loved it, man. I'm, I'm born for this. Um, <laughs> you know, it, well, you know, the thing is, uh, and I know we live in a world now, especially in America, uh, as, as an athlete, uh, you know, having a background like mine, people think that, oh, sports was my way out. It was never. The Army was my way out. Being an officer was my way out. Um, and I just, uh, you know, it was challenging. I had to get comfortable going from being this ghetto kid to being an Army officer in the middle class. Um, and I always thought that when once I became an officer, man, I'll be out of the ghetto like instantly, and that didn't happen. It, it I felt like I was straddling two worlds. I was firm. I had one leg still firmly in the hood because my siblings were still there, my family was still there. When I left the base to quote and go, go home, I went back to the hood, and then, you know, my 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 normal day. Um, an army officer in the middle class, you know? Um, so yeah, it took, a, it took a, a lot of work on myself um, to feel like I belonged initially until yeah, I kind of yeah. got in there. I, and then when you, when you would go back home during the experience, did you feel like you were home or did you feel out of place? I'm trying to think like... Mm. No, I felt, I felt home. I was with family, I, you know, I felt... Um, yeah, I felt comfortable. Uh, you know, I I, I never, because it was always good to go home. It's not it's not the place that I went home and spent a night or two often. I would probably spend one night, you know, the odd every now and again. But it was it was always cool to go home because I was uh, keeping contact with the people that I love and who I care about the most. So so that was fine. Um, they when they came to see me. Uh, felt like a fish out of water. They were always uncomfortable in my new environment. Okay. I think that seems very understandable, right? Because it's like, who is this guy? Like, he left, 
you know, we were kind of all had this thing that we shared, which was our neighborhood and our family. And now, you know, you've got this great opportunity that I'm assuming maybe no one else in your family had, maybe no one else, you know, in your network. Your friends yeah, had. yeah, this is true. This is true. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is that my, my, like my siblings, right, they felt very comfortable around me because I was still just Devon to them. Um, but in the new environment that Devon was hanging out in, they were never at ease with it. Right. You know, I was more at ease going back to them than they were at ease. As like I said earlier that, you know, I had to do a real job on myself to convince myself that I actually deserve to be here. Like nobody gave this to me, man. I earned it. Right. And if the, if the army was your way out, how did you... Well, you got out a different way, you know, <laughs> uh, you're in the army, so you got out that way. And then I think it was your superior officer or someone that sort of, you know, in, in inspired or directed or whatever you to, you know, this year, you, what, what became your Olympic career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that a hard sell? I mean, what, what how did... How did that yeah, no, it's it's so it's so he did not inspire me. You're right, he directed. Okay. <laughs> you like to use this nice word, so more inspire. What's wrong with you, man? I kind of use both of them, so you could choose. Um, so the story is, I, so I actually, so although the army was my way out, I, I I harbored Olympic aspirations. I wanted to go to the Olympics to run, not sprint. I was a middle distance runner because I'm from Jamaica, where everybody is fast, right? And speed is lim is um, is relative, you know. So maybe I was fast somewhere else, just not in Jamaica. So I, I couldn't win any sprints. I ran 800 and 1500 meters and had aspirations of competing in the Olympics in 84. Um, now, when I was at Sandhurst, I jumped out of a plane and I broke my ankle. Don't judge me. I was young and foolish. Okay. I was young and foolish. I admit it. Um, so when I came back to Jamaica, I'm limping and not the picture of an athlete. Not many people knew I was an athlete, actually. But this is, mm, eight to, so if you fast forward to the summer of 87, I'm like, man, the Olympics are coming up. I need to get as fit as I can to try and qualify for the games. So I'm running my five miles every day before I have to report for duty. And then I ran this cross country race and I finished 14 from 40. And they're like, oh my God, it's fit. Hmm. It was, it was run about that same time that the Bob said team idea came about. And so my colonel thought he'd send his young fit officer to the team trials, not expecting me to make the team, but because of a philosophy in the army that says officers must always participate. So since he had his young, uh, 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 his enlisted men going, he thought he'd send his young fit officer to make up the numbers as well. But dude, the minute he told me, I had, I didn't think I was gonna to go to the team trials, had no interest in it, thought this was a ridiculous idea. You know, Bob said team from Jamaica, who the hell comes up with that, right? Um, and, but the minute the Colonel told me I was going to the team trials, then that thing that my grandmother, my grandmother turned on when I was five, kicked in. And, and so it wasn't, I'm just going to go to the team trials and make up numbers. Like, how do I make this team? Like, I don't know how I'm going to make it. All I know is that I have to make the team. And so I just went there and competed as hard as I possibly could. And, you know, that smile does it again, man. It worked for the selection board. And here we are again. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> they selected me. So yeah, so the lesson there for everyone is if you, you know, there's no substitute for the work, you got to do the work. But man, if you got a good smile, show but it. Just that it pushes you over the edge, yeah. I think. Makes your work look better than the guy who's not smiling, even. If yeah, yeah, exactly, dude. I, I just work. I, I um, I was fighting, fighting to 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 like be in that top four because again, you're going through the process and I'm assessing everybody as you're going through. Like I'm. And I know I'm not the fastest guy there, but you know I was just fighting to be considered in the top four. And when your colonel gave you this direction, you know you had been on this track route. Did you resist? Were you like, hey, uh, you know, thank you for thinking of me, but I'm, you know, I'm, 
I'm shooting to be a, a, a track Olympian. That, that, dude, I'm a, I'm a second lieutenant in, in the American Army. That's a first yes, lieutenant. Sir. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you say yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, yeah. that's a great idea. All... <laughs> a, yes, sir. Actually, I was I was relieved because uh, I thought I was going to be in trouble when he called me, and he says, "Oh, oh, oh you're going to go to team trials." I'm like, "Oh, no, okay, fine. I'm not in trouble then. Cool." <laughs> what was the competition like? You know, most of the guys were, uh, um, well, the seven of the top ten. Uh, who were at the team trials were army guys. And I just rem I remember, because I was still new in the army, these were all the, 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 the track stars that I saw in the army when I just came, you know? Okay. So it was, it was fierce. And in my head, I wasn't, I, I described myself as army fit at the time. I could walk 100 miles with 50 pounds on my back and a rifle in my hand. I didn't think I was sports fit. I hadn't done any serious intense sports training for about two years so you know i it was all gut and grit uh, you know I, again just trying to to in my head fit myself in that top four um you know i was doing i was doing well on all the tests i wasn't dominating any of them the the, the one that i dominated was what, what we call a push test I ended up with the two fastest pushes, you know, faster than even the fastest sprinter. So, like, in my, I just remember thinking, man, if there's one test that has to be the most important, it has to be this one. And I ended up, you know, getting the two fastest pushes. And is that, so, is that test pushing a sled or an equivalent of a sled? Yeah, it pushing a makeshift sled on wheels. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, to simulate, I'm like, yeah, if, if, if there's one test that's the most important, it has to be this. And yeah, I killed it. How long in the test period or the, the, the trial, the, the uh, tryout, whatever it's called, was it before you actually you know, got in a bobsled and ran down a, a track? Mm. So we, we uh, so the test happened, the trials happened in September 87, okay. um, early to mid September. And the first time we went on a bobsled track was in October of 87. By the way, the Olympics are in February 88, right? And the first time we're actually going on a bobsled track is uh, in October of 87. Pioneers. I, that's one way <laughs> to describe it. <laughs> it's like, no, like, what were you thinking? <laughs> There's that too, yeah. <laughs> You are very kind. I appreciate you, man. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So most people know the story of, um, you know, the the initial Olympic bobsled team has been made into a movie that's, mm -hmm. I understand, is maybe partly representational, partly uh, fantasy. But I'm really more interested in, like, so you get in, you're in the you're in the army while you're doing it. You you go to three straight Olympics, right? Three straight. I missed. Uh, I missed. I actually missed uh, the '94 games because I just left the army and moved to the U.S. Okay. So there was that. There was '88, '92, and then they flipped. So there was a '94 Olympics in Lillehammer, Norway. So I missed that one, and then I went back in '98. Yeah. So that's an Olympic career that's unlike most Olympians. That uh, most Olympians don't make it to three. And arguably for the stretch of time of four, mm -hmm. four Olympics. So you mentioned that you got out of the army. When, when, could you remind me when that was? Yeah. So, uh, December 92. Okay. So you'd been in two Olympics at that, by that time? Or yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So how do you, and by the way, yeah, you're the first three time Olympian that I've had on my show. So this is really interesting that, and you're in the army during, during this. So, so you go to the Olympics. I mean, or do they let you focus exclusively on the Olympics once you make the team then? So once, I'm, if I'm in Jamaica, I'm splitting uh, army duties with, with training time. I'm actually trying to fit time in to train in between my army duties. That, that takes priority. So there's not a break. Not... Yeah. When, when, but unfortunately, because bobsledding happens overseas, yeah, when I do go for real bobsledding, uh, I'm away. I'm, you know, I'm away in, uh, in North America or Europe. 
So in that way, I'm able to exclusively focus on bob setting. And then I go home and I literally take my bob set uniform off, put my army uniform back on, and I go to work. Okay. And you moved to the U.S. Um, between, uh, what, 92, 94, something like that? Is that about yeah, at the end of 92. So I left the army and I came straight here. What, how come? What, what, what was... <laughs> Ah, I came with a bright idea to study hospitality management. Man. I love traveling. I love meeting people. And I thought I would um, uh, come to school in the U.S. to get a hospitality management degree and, and work my way up to, you know, you know, whatever level. In my head at the time, general manager of a hotel. But I could not shake the bobsled bug. I could not get it out of my system. And so I decided to go pursue that. And so that's how I ended up, um, you know, training for and qualifying for the 98 games. And in the process, discovered this thing they call motivational speaking. And so now, you know, I live in hotels. I don't work in them. Right? That's how I describe it. <laughs> <laughs> and were you able to, so, you know, you're a two-time Olympian. You move to a new country, get this new idea. Um, the Olympic bug sticks with you. You decide that you're going to you know, keep doing that and, and not pursue the other. Does the motivational speaking come right away, or how do you support yourself? <clears throat> so, no. So, I, ooh, so 92. I, so, for uh, about 18, my first 18 months, I worked in a restaurant in the Bronx as a cook. Um, and, you know, going to school at nights, because that's that was a focus, right, uh, to get that, that hospital to management degree. So, um, and Bob setting was, I, I was struggling with it. I was struggling to get it out of my system, right? So I'm working, um, you know, six days a week, going to school at nights, um, trying to get this hospital to management degree. And then I left there and I went to work at a retail store. Uh, so I worked in retail for another 18 months. And again, it's kind of, I've, especially after I left the, the, the kitchen uh, and I now had access to back then phone and fax, right? No emails. Um, I, start, I really started to pursue this box and thing and trying to figure out how I could get it done. And at the, at the end of 1996, I literally dropped everything. And because it, I had to make that move. It was like, either I was going to go back into training now or forget about the 98 Olympics. And so I just dropped everything, man, and, and went to Calgary. How did I support myself that, then? That's a really good question. I, I don't even know. I remember um, 97, we were in Evanston, Wyoming, training eight hours a day and delivering pizzas at night. Mm. You know, we just figured a way. Here, there, little things here and there. Screw scrimping and scratching, eking out an existence and, and all the while training, because you have to do that. And to use your, your, uh, your wording, you know, what, what was it that kept you pushing to that 98, those 98 games? Like what, why? <sighs> so, you know, it, 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 we might sound delusional when we talk about as a Jamaican that I think we have the ability to win a medal. Right? Like, I just so believe that. Um, so I was willing to do the work, put in the effort, make the sacrifice to make that happen. Um, I, and so it, it was just, the thing was in my blood. I'm passionate about it. I love the idea of competing in the Olympic Games. I love the idea of representing my country. So yeah, I was just... Uh, um, yeah, I remember saying to a psychologist, I think I'm, I, I think I'm delusional, but I think I can win an Olympic medal. And he goes, well, you have to be delusional. I'm like, yeah, you know, you're right. I mean, there, there, there's nothing in your, and I think all of us, when we go after these big, crazy dreams, you, you know, there's nothing in our background, in our training, our experience that suggests that this thing is possible. And I know when you use the word delusional, it's using a, negative with a negative connotation but i think you have to be like crazy to think that of six billion people in the world you can be one of them who goes to the, Olymp the olympic games right, right. that's that's the, i describe that as being delusional not in the same breath as 
someone who goes on American Idol and can't sing to save their lives and are shocked when they're told they can't. No, you can't sing. <laughs> like, no, that's delusional, you know? But I think if you can actually go after the goal step by step, sacrifice, go through the pain, do everything that moves you, that delusion meant eventually turns into reality, come, turns into possibility and one day reality. Why the, you know, I, I actually don't attribute delusional to, um, with a negative connotation because I feel like the, so the easiest thing you could do is have an idea and someone say, Devin, come on, man, you're not going to be able to do that. And you go, you're probably right. You know, and it's just gone before you've even taken a step, maybe mm -hmm. toward it, right? Um, I like to use the word selfish when it comes to, you know, really getting a good understanding about what you want. And I don't, and that word has a negative connotation too, but I also feel mm -hmm. like if you're not selfish about really getting clear, you know, what, what you want, you're, you're really going to have a tough time doing it. And all kinds of people are going to say, same thing they're gonna they're gonna want to just fill the they're, they're either gonna want to tell you you can't do it or they're gonna want to fill your time with something that means nothing to you and you take it because you don't know you know kind of where you're going you're right you're right you're right and, and i love the word uh i love what you, you know you use the word selfish and um i bought a book years ago because when i bobsled it and i lived in jamaica every time i landed in america i would walk into the bookstore in the airport and I'd buy a book. Yeah. And I bought this book, The Art of Selfishness. Hmm. And I'm reading through the book and I'm like, but there's nothing selfless about these stories. The reason why I bought the book is because I thought it said The Art of Selflessness. <laughs> um, but, but it was did about... I do. I have it on my bookshelf here somewhere. Yes, because it's exactly what you're saying that if if you want to save the world, and I'm, this is not necessarily in the book, but it's an idea that I've taken from the book and that, that I live by, actually, you have to be able to save yourself first, right? right? You can't, you can't, and that's something I talk about in my speeches, you can't give value to others if you're not a person of value. So you have to first work on yourself to become valuable so you can impart value to others, right? You have to have some achieve some amount of success before you can encourage and challenge other people to be successful. That requires a level of selfishness. Um, not over the board, mind, 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 you can't have any, but I, I need to focus on me. Kind of like, I guess I've always had that selfish streak. You know, we go back to, did I hang out with the boys? And we're like, no, because I wanted to go running. I want you to go play soccer and you want to go fool around and that's just not my thing. Right. Yeah, I think uh, that's funny that you picked it up because you thought it, it said selfless because selfless really sells, right? Servant leadership, selfless. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like, wow, who wouldn't want to be selfless? And I've, I've come to believe that you, you can only truly be selfless once you've been selfish. So in other words, you, 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 you've really identified where you're going, who you want to be, what your future is going to look like. Once you have that, you can be very selfless with other people because yeah. um, your, your selflessness isn't going to get in the way of your, they're actually going to keep, you're, you're actually going to use your selflessness to bring them into your journey and help you get to, you know, what you, what you. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Mm -hmm. In 1998, you, of your last uh, uh, Olympic Games, and I'm wondering how you feel after that. I mean, you um, you took us through, you know, what it what you felt like when you wanted to get into that. Now you're a three-time Olympian, and even if you were like the, the like the biggest athlete that year, I'm still I'm still I'm thinking that once it stops, something happens. Yeah. Um, you know, so I remember coming back uh, from Nagano and I was in Salt Lake City. I had a, an event with my sponsor and I woke up that morning and it was the first time in two years I didn't have to get up to go work out. Mm. 
for the Olympics. I'm like, oh my God, what do I do with myself now? You know, I remember that moment. But the thing that was, well, two things. One, I still had a desire to compete in another Olympic Games. Because uh, uh, again, the, 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 I still had the delusion that, uh, uh, that I had an opportunity to win a medal. I had the ability to win a medal. I didn't feel like I had prepared the way I needed to prepare, the way I thought I needed to prepare in order to win that medal. Because I, you know, half of my time was spent raising funds on the other half, um, you know, training and, you know, you know or, or a third of it anyway, uh, or half of it was spent training uh, and a quarter spent raising funds and, and a quarter doing administrative stuff and dealing with poli the politics of the sport and that kind of stuff. Yeah, okay. So I felt after Nagano that I had created um, a, a good foundation on which I could build and then go, okay, for the next four years, I can truly train because I, I would have had some sponsorship and then let's see where the chips fall. Um, but, I, but then the politics piece of it just got uh, a little bit, I, I realized, hey, I could still qualify for the Olympics, but I'm not gonna be in the shape mentally and physically that I want to be because I would have used up so much energy fighting and dealing with the, the politics of it. Um, so I'm gonna go focus on something else. And it so happens that as I was preparing for Nagano, I met a guy whose only purpose in my life, I'm convinced, was to tell me about this thing called motivational speaking. Because hmm. I'd never heard of it before. And I said, oh, that sounds good. I'll do it after the Olympics. Uh, so as I was, he, he did nothing to help me to go to the Olympics, but now I'm working with a new set of guys. And I said, hey, after the Olympics, I want to be a motivational speaker. Whatever that looks like, I don't even know. <laughs> um, but hey, after the Olympics, I came back and I started speaking. And here we are. So that was interesting. You said, you know, you wanted to do it again because you didn't feel like you were in, you know, the proper shape or state of mind of these other things that were happening it reminded me of what you said earlier when you when you first went to the you know the, the trials you said you were in military shape but not sports shape and now mm -hmm. it sounds like you were saying i was in sports shape but not champion Olympian. not champion exactly right. not championship yeah yeah and last i've never expressed this. it that way before you have a way with yeah. words man thank you i'm gonna have to hang out with you more often <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. You, um, you mentioned the. This is the last question I'm going to ask you about this. But you mentioned the, the the fighting and the politics, and I'm not sure that I understand what that means. And so I'm thinking that the people listening maybe don't have that sort of inside. What what fighting? What politics? Get yeah, every every dude, every sports team um, have some have politics and fighting going on. Like who should be on the team? Who shouldn't be on the team? Who should get the funding? Who shouldn't get the funding? Okay. Uh, who should be given a certain latitude? Who shouldn't? That kind of stuff. Um, and, and that unfortunately exists on our team as well. And so there was just a lot of that going on. Um, and it's it's draining. Um, it, it really is draining, you know? I, I can hand, obviously I can handle it because I was able to do that and qualify for the Olympic games. But I knew that you know to become a champion you, you can't be dealing with so much of that you know i can qualify you know in my head i could qualify for the olympics easy but can i be in a space where i can train um the way i need to train without all of that drama going on so i could possibly win a medal and i didn't feel like that was in the cards yeah Okay. And I didn't necessarily need to be a four-time Olympian, right? I wanted, if I was going to go to the Olympics, I wanted to be in a, a space and in shape, mind and body, that says, you know what? This dude could actually pull it off and win a medal. Yeah. Okay. So you wanted your delusionality surrounded by a complete 100% winning environment. And it yes. And like you'd be able to do that. No, Absolutely. So that's pretty cool. This 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 gentleman, you know, mentions motivational speaking to you, and at a time when you are, you know, it turns out you're near the point where reinvention, if you want to call it that, re, or the next chapter, if you want to call it that, is sort of knocking on the door, right? Um, mm -hmm. Did it did did 
and you said right away it, it, it appealed to you. Um, but I'm wondering, before that, you had to all already be thinking about, you know, what's next. So what were you thinking about going back to the hotel management or were you thinking about going back to Jim? What were you thinking? That would have been going back to hotel management would have been the natural thing. It's a kind of, you know, as I was leaving Jamaica to come to the U.S., that was kind of the focus, man. That's that's the thing that gave me some direction. Okay. So even though I was uh, working in the restaurant as a cook, um, and, you know, those were just hard days emotionally and financially too. But that gave me direction. That gave me focus uh, as much as I was trying to shape the bob set thing. So once I go, okay, I'm going to go do this bob set thing, get it out of my system, and then I'm going to get back to quote unquote real life, you know. Yeah. Um, so him suggesting that, go, oh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm the dude who's always open to opportunities and, and new challenges and adventures, I suppose. So I'm like, I like that. Um, and I will do it. But after the Olympics, that's not something I was going to go take on now when I'm trying to get to the Olympic Games. Because mm-hmm. um, the conversation between he and I started about him being my agent and help me raise funding, fund sponsorship to get to the Olympics. So we, you know, in my head, we needed to focus on that. Um, he didn't do anything to help me to get that done, but you know, thankfully he planted the seed, yeah. motivational speaking. And when you did make the, the decision, were you 100% confident that you would be great at it? Yeah. You should have said, were you 100% delusional that you'd be great at it? Yeah, absolutely. There's this like, okay. so so the dude that I ended up working with, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in Lake Plas Park City, Utah, this is November 97, you know, qualifying for Nagano. And he comes to my room with a VHS tape. So that's how long ago that was. Okay. And so sticks it in the VCR. Is, Google, Google. Yeah, exactly. Kids, it's this yeah. big rectangular thing, right? <laughs> but he sticks it in, and it's a guy called Vince Pacenti, who is a speaker, uh, uh, one time Olympian from Canada, downhill skier, speed skier. And, Vin, and, and so he shows me this video of, of Vince speaking, and he says, can you do that? Because I told him, hey, after the Olympics, I'm going to be a motivation speaker. And he, and he goes, can you do that? And I'm like, yeah, I could do that. So I, I came back and I started to do that, you know? And it, it just it kind of grew from there. And the first time you're speaking in front of a Fortune 100 crowd, and if you go to... If you go to Devin's website, there's a very long list of the clients that he's worked with, and it's they're all names that you all recognize. Do you are you thinking are you on stage thinking to yourself, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, or are you on stage thinking to yourself, how does a barefoot kid from <laughs> Olympic Gardens, Jamaica, you know, who wanted to be in the military as my way out, you know, transition into the to a three time Bobsled Olympian, and now here I am with all these people that, you know, mm. just are, have such a different, came from such a different place and arrived in this theater or auditorium or whatever with me from such different, on such different paths. Did you feel like I'm exactly where I supposed to be or did you feel like, wow, what, <laughs> what the hell's going on? Yeah, I was working my way into it, man. Um, my first I would say professional speech was actually to my sponsor. Uh, they had a, they had their sales kickoff meeting in Vegas in January '98, and I was a surprise speaker. And I um, I think I spoke in my bobsled uniform uh, at the time, I, back then I used to. Um, and so I had a, a lavalier mic that was clipped on. So I'm try- and I and I had my notes. Everything that I was going to say was written out, right, or typed out. And it was on the podium, and I'm trying to be cool, right, by walking away from the podium. But I can't walk away too far because I, I feel like I'm tethered like an astronaut on a spacewalk, right? Yeah, yeah. So I need, which was cool because I needed that safety line, to be honest. I wasn't as confident as I am now. And I, so I would kind of walk away to demonstrate some level of confidence, but I always had to wander back to the podium to check on my notes. Um, but it went well, you know, nobody booed. That's, 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 a, that's the first, um, 
that's a that's a giant you know criteria yeah yeah, yeah 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 but actually people came up and they were like well they're so um they were inspired and pressed there was one girl who came to me afterwards and she said you know i was gonna quit uh but after i heard your speech i'm gonna stay hmm. so you know that that give me some encouragement was validation uh, in in a way, and so I just I, I came back and I, I you know started just telling my story and, and it I guess the more I told that story of growing up in Olympic Gardens and and all that that entailed, I felt more comfortable because prior to that I was was hyper conscious of my background and it's not something I would have willingly shared. Oh, I'm from the hood and I grew up in a shack and. You know, despite the fact that I've gone on to accomplish some stuff, I was hypersensitive right. uh, about about the, the the beginnings. Yeah, about talking about it, right? You just like mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, now we're like a badge of honor, man. It's like yeah, yeah right, yeah, mm. because it's your story, right? And it's yeah. not anybody else's story, and it's pretty, you know, profound story as well. So I know you talk about a lot of different things, but this keep on pushing thing. You know, it's your book, it's your podcast, it's obviously, uh, um, you know, has an attachment to the bobsled. Mm -hmm. But what does it actually mean, Devin? Like someone's like, you know, yeah, you, talk I, about, I, you talk about making the impossible possible. And, and people have heard all that stuff once or twice in their lives, you know. But how do you, how does you, how does your keep on pushing message sort of manifest itself in a way that where I'm like moved? Yeah, I often joke and say, dude, I'm a bobsledder. That's as creative as I get. You know, we push things, right? But it, um, it yes, it does have this a bobsledder knowledge, right? That's how you start the race, you push the sled. But it's not one massive push. It's actually a process, right? A, a four-month sled weighs 650 pounds. So, yes, you need at the start this massive amount of energy to get it going. But then you can't stop there. You have to keep on pushing. Uh, theoretically, if you stop, the sled could literally come to a, a halt as well, right? Mm -hmm. And even as you're heading down the track, in a real way, you're still pushing. You, you have the ice conditions, the weather conditions, you have the twists and turns of the track, and you also have the limits of your own abilities. You're trying to do better than what you did previously, uh, which reminds me of the success journey of life. Like, like every delusional dream that we have is sitting on its own, its equivalent of a 650 pound bobsled. Hmm. And, and so how do you get that baby moving? You, you have to come up with a massive amount of energy to get over the inertia, but then you can't just stop there. You have to follow through, right? You have to keep on pushing. And as you start out on that journey, there are all these things, whether it's people who don't believe uh, because the delusion meant the impossibility of your dream is glaringly obvious to them just not you because you're so blinded by i don't know whatever it is yeah um so you have to fight that sometimes you have to fight your own self-doubts because that creeps in sometimes i wonder if i'm doing the right thing here i wonder if i'm going to make a fool of myself right you have to push past that um and then you're, you know we, 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 i was talking about my first time speaking and getting better so you're always trying to get better you're you should always be trying to get better. So you have to be pushing the limits, the boundaries of your own abilities as well, right? That's how you grow. Um, so it's a, it's a process. It's dynamic, it's ever changing, it's fluid uh, process through which we are transforming ourselves. But in the process, to go back to some part of the conversation we had earlier, in the process, you're also transforming the people and the organizations around you. Helping them, right? So it's about growth, constant growth. That's what we are created and designed for, right? And right. the idea that you're making some progress, man, doesn't have to be a like giant leaps. But if you're making a tiny pro progress, you feel that's the thing that gives us a certain amount of contentment. That you know, mm, yeah, you know, it's not a home run, but I got a single, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, and giant leaps are scary, but, you know, one step forward or, yeah. you know, a little bit of progress is not scary, right? The, the, the stakes Complete. aren't that high. It was Agreed. funny when you said, you you know, you got to get up to speed to, to, you know, break the inertia, because I was thinking after you said that, that 
even when that happens, now you get used to a different speed, but it becomes your can become your new inertia, right? Mm -hmm. So there's constant ever flu ever changing fluid process, man. Every you're right. So every time you you push to a new level, that becomes your new foundation, your new normal, yeah. and you have to know push past that to get to the next level. Always so. You have to keep on pushing. And you know, the, the challenge sometimes, I think, w with the philosophy is people feel that it's always about struggle. No, it's about, well, growth does involve struggle. Uh, at, at every point in our lives, you know, we are, you know, we are to be growing. And it, 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 it involves struggle in the sense that you have to change something about you, something about what you're doing. So even if it's uh, going from, you know, working 40, 50, 60 hours a week to retiring, there is that change that you have to deal with. And so it requires, it's, it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but it requires you now pushing uh, yourself to go from somebody who was going at 100 miles an hour to, oh, I'm retiring. What can I do now in retirement to, make myself feel worthwhile because i think people think <laughs> retirement means that you go tie yourself out to a pastor like a cow and like cattle and no it's like you still you're a human being and you your life still needs to count so where's that next step that you're going to push yourself to that's powerful because the 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 um the out to pasture thing can become really real in a hurry if you don't have something that you're, you know, striving towards some purpose that that's meaningful to you, because I think people underestimate that, you know, when you've been involved in something for a long time, whether it's as an Olympian or an athlete or just an executive or just someone working at a company, there's a lot of meaning attached to that. And even if it's not like, you know, setting the world on fire, meaning without it, it has to be replaced. Yes. Something has absolutely. to replace it. Hmm. Otherwise, you die a very slow death. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you die a very slow death. It's, so two, two your things life I'd is void like of meaning. Yeah. Two things I'd like to, to finish up with. First, your foundation. Um, keep on pushing foundation. Uh, it seems to me if my time frames right, about six years after you started as a motivational speaker, you in 2004 or so? You yeah, 2006, 2006. 2006. Yeah. Okay, so uh -huh. eight years later. And so you're, go you're going around the world, you're becoming more and more famous as a, as a, as a speaker and not, a, not uh, as just, a, you know, solely as an Olympian or a, or a you know, a decorated uh, soldier. What makes you want to start a foundation? Because I, well, I know they're not, they're not easy. <laughs> no, they're not. And I, I think it's because I have a screw missing. I like to go do the hard things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I was back in Jamaica and I visited the school and I was speaking to the principal. And I'm like, so what's the biggest challenge you have here? And it was kids were coming to school hungry. And what do we know? If, if kids are hungry, they can't learn. If they can't learn, they don't get educated. They're not educated. They can't really be productive citizens, you know. And what I know uh, is that when you grow up in a place like I grew up, and in you know other places similar, you grew up in a place like Jamaica and uh, and other places similar to that. If you've missed the bus, you've missed the bus. There's there's no other bus is coming, right? Um, and so I wanted to do what I could to help these kids because I can. I can clearly remember, this was after high school, I'm 19 years old, and just before, that summer before I got into the army, um, and there was a real possibility, as I described earlier, that I would not have been selected. You know, So what if I don't get selected? What next? Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that would be. And what I remember feeling is despair. You know, if, if there's no hope, that's all that's left, despair. If you have some ambition and you can't figure the next way out. Um, uh, and, and I still remember that feeling today, uh, you know. And so I wanted to do what I could to 
help put those kids on a path that would uh, lessen the chance that they would feel that despair and you know and for, go take the wrong road. Um, so growing up in an environment like that and then serving in the military and going back to the old neighborhood to go look for the quote unquote bad boys, you know, one of my favorite things to do. So I was able to, I've seen and lived both sides of this equation, right? Mm -hmm. And um, this is a very school and this very classrooms that I learned in and the schoolyard I ran around. And so I saw myself in these kids. So I wanted to do what I could to help. And do you think that those kids could or can see themselves in you? I think so. It's, it's really interesting, you know, it's a really cool thing actually to go back and, uh, you know, like the, the school supplies program that, I, that, that, that we have there. And like, you see one line, long line of little boys and everybody's want, want me to look in their books the notebooks that I gave them and the work that they did and to the point where the teacher's like, go back to class, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, um, uh, and then just, I remember a few years later, visiting a high school where my aunt worked and there was one, one of the boys who was attending that high school was at that primary school, that elementary school. And him just talking about um, the, the impact that my what I was doing at the school had on him and his friends in you know, on the way they were and I remember him saying, Well, when you're a kid, you think all kind of strange things, don't you? Because he was talking about he wanted to be a scientist and develop something that could make you breathe in a black hole. And I'm like, I remember that. I'm like, you know, but just as and he goes, Man, you brought so many stuff for so many things for us. Hmm. So I, I, I hope that, yeah, they will go, wow, uh, if he can do it and he's not all that smart or good looking, then, you know, I could do it too. Right. So last thing is your podcast, Keep On Pushing. You want to tell everybody about that? And, and Yeah, man. So I got that started, you know, thank you, COVID. Um, I think I was thinking about that a little bit before, but I am. Um, Look, I've, I've uh, you know, been interviewed only a million times and I never interviewed anyone. And, but I, and I understood the Olympian world and the fact that, you know, you go, you have these big crazy dreams and you fight and you struggle and, and you achieve your dreams. So, so I wanted to tell those stories because I think they're, uh, there are lessons that everyone else can learn. And, and because I understood that world and I never interviewed anybody, I started there just interviewing Olympians. But then as I'm thinking, you know what, there's so many other people out there, man, who they didn't compete in the winter or the summer Olympics, but in, in many respects, there, there's a correlation to what they're doing. And those stories uh, are to be told. Too. So I just started to spread my wings. And again, it is a process, right, of transforming and hopefully becoming a better interviewer um, that, that I'm able to uh, share uh, these experiences and nuggets with with everyone uh, you know, challenging and encouraging them to yes keep on pushing keep on going nice well Devin, this has been such a pleasure having you on thank you so much for making time for me and you know the work that you're doing for your foundation and the work that you're doing for the rest of us you know helping helping us understand that what's may seem impossible is actually possible and there's a way to get it, but you, but it's not going to be given to you. <laughs> you know, you have to go yeah. get it. You have to keep on yeah. pushing. Um, I gave your website and some other stuff at the beginning. Is there other ways that you want people to connect with you? Oh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, Instagram and Twitter, um, the dude at keep on pushing 88 at keep on pushing 88. You can find me on Facebook. I'm the dude. In, there are several Devon Harris's on Facebook. I'm the one in the to make a Bob said uniform. <laughs> you can't mistake him. He's the one in the yeah. uniform. Yeah. All right, Devin, thanks so much. Hey, Mike, it was a pleasure, man. Thank you for having me on.
podcast is brought to you by WinCheck Studios. We are an all-in-one educational platform for podcasters that revolutionizes how hosts leverage content to increase engagement with listeners, downloads, and income. We come together to focus on community, collaboration, and collective impact. For more information on how you can interact directly with our hosts, access exclusive live content with offers you can't get anywhere else from our official partners, join our purpose-driven community by visiting www.winject.com. If you're ready to build a career doing what you love, then we're ready to see you there.